Rock, paper, scissors, shoot! Did you win? Probably, if you've watched the video before. You'd have a good reason to expect me to do a certain action in that case. If not, well, you only had a 1 in 3 chance of either winning, losing, or calling a draw. But we already know that, right? There's not really much to this game. How terribly dull. Well, hold that thought for a bit, and let me see if I can't change your mind. At its face, not many would consider Rock, Paper, Scissors to be a very complete or satisfying game. It's very random, perhaps completely so, and there doesn't seem to be any way to come up with a strategy to outsmart your opponent. It's all guesswork. Yet, at the same time, it's an essential base component of well-made strategy games, at least within a few very broad stipulations that we'll cover. Virtually any well-designed strategy game can be reduced to rock, paper, scissors, or at least a sequence of numerous instances of rock, paper, scissors, if you boil it down far enough. In fact, as much as rock, paper, scissors seems like something to avoid for all its random and unstrategic elements, a game effectively needs to include it to be strategic, or it would lose most of its meaning without it. First, let's consider the reason why we don't like rock, paper, scissors in its base form. The first big problem lies in the complete symmetry of it all. One does not have any substantial reason to pick one choice over the other, or to expect one's opponent to pick one choice over the other. Every option is completely symmetrical. Thus, unless you're facing off against someone you know to be an obsessive, compulsive, barber, bureaucrat, or rock farmer, you don't have anything to go on. What changes this up significantly is when weights are added to the mix. Say we take regular RPS, but you play for points over multiple rounds. Winning with scissors will give you, say, two points, paper will give you three, and rock will give you a massive seven. Now suddenly the dynamic has changed completely. We have an obvious optimal choice here now. Rock is worth the most, by quite a margin. Naturally, people will be drawn to this supposed overpowered option, but of course, being of good sound mind, we all realize that rock can still be beaten, so of course, you want to keep this feeling in check and not abuse the option. And why is that, exactly? Because of course, your opponent is quite aware of how much you want to use the overpowered option, and they'll be reacting accordingly based on what they know that you want to do. Although this is still a simplistic example, it demonstrates how rock, paper, scissors can be improved while maintaining its core. The game's premise still exists, you have options that beat other options, and everything is still capable of both winning and losing in some circumstances. Nothing is either supremely useful or entirely worthless. Yet, adding the weights also introduces the concept of mind games into the mix. Now the players have reasons behind their choices, and reasons for suspecting what their opponent's reasons for their choices will be. These are the kind of decisions that are worked into and hidden in games. Decisions you are making are actually forms of rock, paper, scissors, with its choices weighted and disguised, and can come in many shapes and sizes within the scope of the larger game. In RPGs, certain types of moves or plays will counter others. In real-time strategy games, certain units will hard counter other types. In fighting games, certain attacks will beat out others when they are used at the same time. Of course, even these kind of systems can feel a bit forced. I mean, so what if grass beats water beats fire beats grass? Gary mother effin' Oak still picks the one that counters you every time, so you might as well choose Charmander because he looks the coolest, and because they gave him Iron Tail in the remake. The thing to realize, though, is that RPS is not just present in these intentionally designed decisions of element beats element, as handpicked by the game designers. There are also an emergent property that appears in all sorts of decisions that you make in all sorts of games without ever being forcibly designed that way. Take, for instance, a real-time strategy game, like StarCraft. Games of these sorts have resources that can be collected and invested back into themselves in a sort of pseudo-economy. Your workers collect money, and that money can in turn be spent to purchase more workers to gain even more money even faster. But you also have to spend that money on buildings and units to fight with. Spending resources on one thing is money that could have been spent on the other. In these systems, overarching macro-management concepts of short-term versus long-term, offense versus defense, actually work in a rock-paper-scissors sort of way. Namely, long-term investment beats short-term defense, short-term offense beats long-term investment, and short-term defense beats short-term offense. The obvious choice that beginners to such games tend to learn first is the economy strategy, namely that investing in resource gain is good. Channel your resources back into their own gain. It leads to the exponential growth of wealth and will eventually allow you to overwhelm your opponents through sheer numbers. Building units too early just detracts from your potential to get higher and higher income. How surprised these players are, then, when they are hit by their first rush. A rush is a maneuver where a player does not invest in growth and instead spends their resources for offense in the short term, effectively sacrificing their future potential for damage here and now. It sounds short-sighted, but it's actually the counter to the economy method. 
The rush will destroy the player who is building up early, so that the future scenario where the builder player would have had the advantage never actually comes. New players will often call foul on rushes, noting how cheap they are and how they were never really given a chance to play, but rushes are counterable with a heavy investment in defense. When all other factors are equal, defense usually has an advantage against offense in most game situations. Defensive units will be more cost effective for their jobs, being more powerful but having less or no mobility, perhaps simply having the home field advantage with less travel time or logistic cost to worry about. If one spends all their resources on defense, it will beat out someone who spends all their resources on offense, and their rush will be crushed, leaving them crippled. Perhaps most clearly, such a defensive strategy also has a counter. Against someone who is only defending, it's best to use the original strategy of investing into one's own economy. For every resource that one's opponent spends on defense that's not used or needed, they're wasting it in comparison to someone who's building up. You'll notice now how these broad decisions have an RPS relationship, and a very strong, important one at that. These are the sort of high-level decisions that take place while playing such games as real-time strategy games. How many workers will I build? When do I expand to a new base? When do I attack? And when do I fall back? These are questions that new players often ask themselves in confusion and can't figure out. It seems random and indeterminate, like vanilla rock-paper-scissors. Well, it is RPS, but it's much more like our weighted version. You have reason to suspect which of the options your opponents will play, whether they be aggressive, defensive, or conservative, whether they want to play safe or risk it. Not only that, but there's also scouting in such games. Plays of these RPS strategies are not instant here, and by sending a scout to gather intelligence, you can determine which choice your opponent is playing ahead of time. It's like getting a peek at what your opponent is throwing a fraction of a second early. Cheating in regular rock-paper-scissors, but fair play and encouraged here. This concept is far more universal than one might think. Let's take a look at a turn-based game now, like, for example, Civilization. The same concepts apply here. The most common base strategy is to build lots of long-term gain structures like libraries and banks, which cause exponential growth over time, at the expense of one's military. Such a strategy is very vulnerable to an opponent who says screw it to getting an early technology or economy lead, and instead launches the infamous Axman Rush, an early overwhelming offensive with ancient era units. It could outright annihilate the other player, or at least give such a huge territory advantage that they could then switch to a different strategy afterward. A short-term offensive strategy of the Axeman Rush is in turn countered by a heavy usage of archers and walls, which are far more powerful and cost-effective than the offensive Axeman army if, and only if, used defensively. And, in turn once more, such a reliance on defense will probably be bested by someone who invests in, well, libraries and banks, who will quickly take the lead and eventually overwhelm with superior technology. As you can see, even though civilization also tends to have obvious instances of rock-paper-scissors at the low level, with things like Spearman beats Chariot beats Axeman beats Spearman or whatnot, there is also this overarching game of rock-paper-scissors decisions that takes place on a grander scale, and in many ways trumps the smaller scale. You still have to consider which units beat which in order to win your battles, but how you play in your offense and your defense, your short-term and your long-term, that affects the entire game in a massive way. You can find this principle in many, many games, too countless to number, from collectible card games like Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh, to the more action-oriented strategy games of MOBAs like Dota and LoL. There are analog board games as well, like Settlers of Catan or Scepter of Zavendor. Perhaps more frightening or intriguing is how you can even apply these principles to real-life decision-making. Once you realize the patterns, you might find that you start to see it everywhere. Well, there's a lot more to say, but this has already become quite long. I hope this has given you something to think about, and perhaps has caused you to think about rock, paper, scissors in a different light. Stay tuned as we continue this discussion. Farewell for now. Thank you.